Hello, everyone. Welcome to GBH's Ask the Expert event today. I know that a couple of you joining us early know already that it's all about astronomy, but do not worry. You do not have to be an expert in the field to join us today and send us some questions. I'm Suki Bennett. I'm the senior digital editor at Nova PBS, which is the science documentary series. It's actually produced right here at GBH. Um, I know that a lot of you know of GBH as your local PBS station, but we're also the producer of five of the national PBS brands as well, including Nova. Um, we're really excited for you to join us here today uh, with our star of the show, who's astronomer Brian Gainsler. But before we meet him, um, I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us, including our leadership circle and RLS members. A big shout out to all of you. We appreciate your continued generous support. And before we get started, we do have a couple of people behind the scenes who you're not going to see throughout the event, but who are actually running the show for us today. So I'm going to head over to meet Bailey, the producer of this event. Hello, Bailey. Hi, thanks, Suki. Welcome, everyone. So glad to have you here. Unlike us, you will not be able to hear or see you. Um, we want to thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you enjoy our astronomy event today. And a big part of this event is asking uh, Brian all of your questions. So to help us out with that today, we have Ileana who's going to be managing our Q&A tab. Hey, Ileana. Hi, thank you so much, Suki. Hi, I'm Ileana hanging out in the Q&A tab. We wanna hear all your questions. So if you wanna ask a question, be sure to click the Q&A tab and type in. Be sure to let us know where you're tuning in from before you submit your question. If you see a question you want to hear the answer to, just make sure to vote for it by giving it a thumbs up. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the event. Thank you so much, Ileana. So just to reiterate what Ileana was saying, definitely mention your name, mention which platform you're coming from. We'll give a shout out to you when, you're, um, when we're directing your questions to Brian. And now to meet the star of the show today, welcome Brian Gainsler. You're an astronomer at the University of Toronto, but what else about you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, Siki, and hi, everyone. Thanks so much for calling in today. So uh, about me, well, the first thing to start my story is the background of my uh, video panel that you can see. This is the cover of a book that my parents bought me when I was four years old, a long time ago now, about astronomy. And I read this book, and I was just blown away. And I thought, oh, my goodness, this is what I want to be when I grow up. And I never wavered from that. And many decades later, I'm now an astronomer. So I just love the fact that I still have this book and that it reminds me of what it's like to be an excited child with lots of questions. And it's incredibly fulfilling that uh, I now I'm doing what I always wanted to do. That's really awesome. So I'm a little bit of an astronomy enthusiast myself. I can't say that I have much knowledge about the field at all um, beyond being a science journalist, but I remember the thing that got me really interested in science was stargazing with my dad when I was little and looking at meteor showers. Uh, Brian, do you have any suggestions for kids who like to pursue a career in astronomy? What should they do in school or during their time at home? One of the things I love about astronomy is you can get so heavily involved, uh, you know, without any special equipment or um, qualifications. You know, if you're if you're hot, if you were super interested in brain surgery. There's not a lot you can do about that unless you become a brain surgeon, but with astronomy, everyone can get involved. So what I'd say is um, start by going uh, to the store and getting an astronomy magazine. There's several week monthly astronomy magazines and they have introductions for people who have never done any astronomy before. And they point out what you can see in the night sky each month of the year. You don't necessarily need any fancy equipment. You can get by just with a pair of binoculars or just with a relatively cheap telescope. Uh, there's lots you can see. Particularly if you live in a big city like Boston, then, you know, unfortunately the skies are not that dark because of all the city lights. So um, you can either get out to somewhere away from the city so you can see lots of faint things. But if you're stuck in the city, then binoculars or a small telescope are all you need because you can't see faint things anyway. A small telescope, you can see beautiful nebulae and star clusters and double stars. So it's, it's pretty easy to, to get going pretty quickly just with a magazine and a pair of binoculars. 
And question, Ryan, um, Carol M. from Norwood is wondering, what was the name of that book that you, you received from your parents when you were four? Um, that, the, the book was called The Album of Astronomy, so a very simple name. And it, it basically said, there are all these things we don't know about the universe. And uh, I was just blown away because every other book I had looked at to that stage, like books about dinosaurs or cars or volcanoes, they all had answers. They said, this is how it works. This is, this is what we've learned. And this was the first book I'd ever read that said, we don't know anything. Um, and that just blew my mind because as a young kid, I just figured that someone knew the answer to everything. Like if it wasn't my parents, it would be the teacher or the library or these days Wikipedia just the concept that there were unknown things that nobody in the world knew the answer to just blew my mind. And then the other thing that blew my mind is that there are people who get paid, it's their job to actually figure these things out. And that one day, if you're, if you're smart and you're lucky, you could be the one that figures something out for the very first time. So it was the fact that this book admitted defeat that we didn't know all the answers that excited me. And what's even more cool is if you look at that book now, all of the, the big mysteries of the 1970s they're all things we have the answers to now. Like not, almost nothing, none of the mysteries in, in, in that book are even interesting now. But now we have even bigger questions that we don't know the answer to that weren't even hinted at in that book. It just makes me think of just this week, um, hearing about the black hole paradox and physicists coming a step closer to figuring out what happens to information when it reaches the event horizon of a black hole. And this is a question that's been floated for about 60 years and physicists are still toying with different ideas of whether information is lost or if it can come out essentially on the other side. So yeah, I think that those questions can be really inspiring and that's cool to hear about that. Uh, we have a question kind of on that note from Dialis who says that it's been 90 years since the idea of dark matter was first floated and nothing really conclusive has been found yet regarding dark matter and then same with supersymmetry. So do you have any notes on these phenomena and scientists pursuit of figuring out dark matter and these other concepts yeah so for those those that might not be familiar this is something that's a little bit embarrassing um roughly 80 percent of the matter in the universe is invisible and we have no idea what it is um and so just as a reflection of our extreme ignorance we give it a very not useful title we just call it dark matter because because we can't see it um, some, some have suggested that, you know, dark matter, it's not that it's black, it's that it's, it's it, maybe it should be called clear matter, matter or transparent matter because it's invisible. Um, so when you look at the night sky and you see galaxies and stars and nebulae, all of those things, uh, as wonderful as they are, are all made of atoms and molecules and protons and electrons and neutrons. They're made of the same things that make up you and me and everything around, around us. But 80% of the universe is made of something else, and we do not know what that is. Uh, pretty much an instant Nobel Prize for anyone who can figure this out. We're not sure, but our current thinking is that some type of subatomic particle, uh, you know, like a proton or electron or a neutron, but it's just a much harder particle to see or detect, uh, and we haven't yet found it. But the, the whole universe is just swimming in this giant sea of particles, and the stuff that we think is important, the, the atoms and the molecules, are just a relatively small footnote to what makes up the bulk of the universe. So in some sense, we're making a lot of progress in dark matter and that we're getting better and better at mapping out how much of it there is and, and where it is and how it's distributed in the universe. But in other respects, uh, it's been a bit frustrating because we still basically do not know what dark matter is. And uh, so it's on the one hand, it's a bit embarrassing. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it's incredibly exciting that we are just nowhere near close to figuring out just what the universe is made of. Absolutely. I think a big pursuit of science and what we hear about often is new discoveries and these opportunities to make new discoveries. And there's definitely less talk in some respect of what we already know well, because it's already been talked about. So those opportunities are really cool. And not to self-promote 100%, but uh, there is a 2018 Nova film called Nova Wonders, What is the Universe Made Of? And I highly recommend it if you're interested in learning more about dark matter. Um, speaking of these unknown questions, we had a question. I'm searching for it now. Um, David Bergsbagen is wondering, what are the biggest questions you'd like to know the answers to? 
So me personally, I mean, there's the, we're supposed to say, astronomers are supposed to say, what is dark matter? And the other big one is there's something else called dark energy. So the other one I'm supposed to say is what is dark energy? But if you ask me personally, the biggest question that I would like to know the answer to is what is going on with these types of objects called fast radio bursts or FRBs? So we now know, this was, it was discovered in 2007, that once about every 10 seconds, somewhere in the sky, there's this incredibly bright flash of radio waves, like a little burst of static, really bright, sometimes uh, uh, you know, brighter than the sun, that lasts for one millisecond, and it happens about every 10 seconds. So for the whole of human history, every 10 seconds, there's been this incredibly bright flash of radiation. And we only discovered this in 2007. So we've now discovered a few, we're, these are quite hard to find because they're only on for a millisecond. Uh, and we've now found uh, this happening all over the sky, but we have no idea what fast radio bursts are. Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure they're not alien signals or anything like that. They are some natural phenomenon, um, but they're really puzzling. Most of them only happen once and then we never see them again, but there's a small number that actually repeat. So the, they flash on and off randomly, maybe once every month or so. And then there's one that repeats every 16 days. So uh, they have a range of properties and we just really have no idea what they are. So I would like to figure out what are fast radio bursts. It might turn out to be something really profound that changes our whole understanding of the universe, or it might be like, oh, it's just stars that are giving off flares at random or something. But the fact that we just have no idea at the moment and they're just everywhere, just seems to be a real affront to our, our, uh, our view that we, we want to understand the universe. And it, it's a pressing problem that I hope that uh, I and others can figure out in the next few years. And Brian, I remember reading this in the news, I think just last week that scientists recently reported hearing an FRB for the first time ever in our galaxy. Is that true? And why is that important and substantial? So that was really exciting. This is something that I was part of and, and we announced it last week, is these, these FRBs, these fast radio bursts, even though we don't know what they are, they seem to be coming from a long way away. So many uh, hundreds of millions or even billions of light years away. So way outside our Milky Way galaxy, a significant distance across the universe from us. But then uh, earlier this year, we had a fast radio burst go off in our own Milky Way. So this is right in our backyard and it was incredibly bright. And what's more, it came from a star that we already knew about. So we had this star in our catalogs already and we'd studied it before. And this star gave off a fast radio burst. So uh, this is a special type of star. It's called a magnetar. And as the name suggests, it's incredibly ma magnetic. It's uh, something like a, a thousand trillion times more magnetic than the Earth. Uh, so we now are pretty sure, based on this one event, that at least some of these fast radio bursts must be these magnetar stars. However, if you put this object at this distance of hundreds of millions of billions of light years, we wouldn't have been able to see the fast radio bursts from it. So it can explain some fast radio bursts, but it probably can't explain all fast radio bursts, which means that even more exciting, not only do we not know what fast radio bursts are, but there's probably at least two, if not three different types of fast radio bursts. And so maybe we've solved what one of them are, but there are other categories that we still need to understand. That's really cool. And just to segue back to how people who aren't in the field can really get inspired and get involved in astronomy. Um, at a local level, I'm not sure if you'll know this because I know that you're up in Canada and not down in Massachusetts, but Marla from Lowell, Mass is wondering, what's a good site to use to see in real time these different phenomena that are happening um, in our sky where we are? So of course, um, you know, they, uh iPhones haven't put us out of a job yet, but there are these apps you can get for iPhone and Android. I'm just looking at one of them now to remind myself the name. There are apps you can get that are just fantastic because you, once you install them, you just hold your phone up to the sky and it, it, not, it can figure out where you're looking and it just shows you what you should be able to see in the sky. So, um, and they obviously figure out from GPS where you are. So uh, there's a bunch of them. I, I don't have any association with any of these apps, uh, but the one that I use is called Sky Guide. Uh, I find it really nice. It costs like about five bucks. Um, and so it doesn't matter uh, whether you're in Lowell or whether you're in Toronto, it just figures out where you are. Uh, and you can type in, you know, show me a comet or show me a nebula or show me a planet and it will tell you exactly where to look. So I know it's a bit cheating uh, to use your phone rather than to sort of be able to recognize everything by eye. 
but it just makes it so easy. And you know, you can just point to an object and say, I wonder what that is. And your phone will tell you. Instead of cheating, we'll call it a learning tool. Um, I remember, I think my dad downloaded Sky Map, if I'm getting the name right, and just seeing him after he downloaded that, you know, when the night sky is above us and he's like, look at what I can do with my phone. He's just holding it up and it's identifying all of these constellations and planets and stars. And it's absolutely phenomenal. And I think it's a great way of getting into the field, even if you're just doing it in your free time. Um, Corinna Smith is wondering, she says, I know astronomers can measure long distances by using Cepheid variables. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But how do these stars form and why are they so reliable? Uh, Karina, that's, that, that's uh, a great question. And it also has very strong ties to, to Massachusetts because the person who, who uh, figured this out was Henrietta Leavitt, who was an astronomer um, in Cambridge, Mass, um, you know, 100 plus years ago. So Cepheid variables are these special types of stars that, that slowly pulse. They get brighter and they get fainter. And because they always get brighter and fainter in the same way, uh, you can use them. They're like, they're like yardsticks that you can use. If you can find a Cepheid, you can figure out how far away it is because uh, their pulsing tells you how bright they should be. And once you know how bright they should be, you can compare that to their actual brightness to work out their distances. So um, Corinna asks like, how do they form and why are they so reliable? Um, so Cepheid variables are, are normal stars, stars like the sun, but they've just reached a particular phase of their life. So as stars get older, they start to become uh, unstable. Uh, and there's a particular period of their lives where at least for a while, they start to pulse. So our own sun will go through a period of its life where it starts to pulse. Um, so, and when stars are at this particular stage of their lives, we know from calculations that their interior structure always has the same particular pattern, which creates a very particular type of instability. So the reason why they're so reliable is because all stars are mostly the same. And when all stars get to a certain age, they all behave in the same way with this particular type of instability. Um, so it's, you know, it's a bit like sort of asking, you know, how come all babies know how to cry? It's just something that babies do because it's the only way they can get attention. Um, so it's the same with stars. When they reach a certain part, at point in their lives, their structure forces them to pulsate in a particular way. And uh, we, we understand the physics of that, the calculations of that extremely well. We've never gone on a spaceship and sliced open one of these stars and sort of taken a photo, but our calculations are so good that if we could do that, we're pretty sure that we would see exactly what we expect. That's awesome. I love the, the baby's cry metaphor. I think that's a great way of putting it. Um, Leonard has a question going back to dark matter. Could dark matter be composed primarily of black holes? Um, that's a, that's a, a really interesting question. So in the 90s, this was the big question. In the in 1990s, we knew that dark matter existed and there were two different theories of dark matter. One was uh, uh, called machos and the other was called wimps. Um, and astronomers like to have fun with acronyms and they, these actually stand for things. MACHO stands for massive compact halo object, which basically means that dark matter is composed of small individual dense objects like black holes. And WIMPs stands for weakly interacting massive particles, which essentially means it's just some sort of subatomic particle of which there are trillions and trillions of them sort of smoothly spread throughout, uh, throughout the universe. And so astronomers in the 1990s came up with some very clever experiments that could actually tell whether dark matter is made of machos or wimps. Now, normally when you set up these sort of, is it A or is it B um, uh, questions, the answer is always a bit of both. Uh, so some of the dark matter is probably black holes, but what this experiment showed is that the wimps beat the machos and that most of the uh, dark matter in the universe is not individual objects like black holes, but it's just some sort of invisible gas, some sort of set of particles that we can't see. So black holes certainly contribute, but most of it, the 80% of the missing matter in the universe has to be uh, these WIPs, these subatomic particles. So it's a great question. It's one that astronomers spent a huge amount of time and effort over many, many years trying to figure out. That's awesome. Now, before we get to the next question, I just wanna remind everyone who's watching check out the Q&A tab, drop your questions in there if you have any curiosities that you want to point to Brian to. 
Um, we're really happy to answer any of your questions that you have related to astronomy today. Uh, now, speaking of dark matter, um, we had a question from Glenn Richards. Per your comments on dark matter, if we can't see it, um, you know, people in the 90s had these hypotheses about how it interacts and what it is, but how, how are we even sure that it's there? Right. So firstly, let me say we're absolutely sure that it's there because we have measured its presence in about four or five different ways and they all give the same answer. So I won't go through all the different ways that we measure the presence of dark matter, but I'll just mention one which is my favorite, which is we know from uh, Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity that gravity bends light. And when I say bends light, I mean it distorts light. So we know, for example, mirrors bend light, they reflect light. Uh, if you look at a flat mirror, you just see a reflection of yourself. But if you go to a fun house and look at a curved mirror, you see a very distorted picture of yourself where you appear short or, or tall or stretched or whatever. So it turns out that uh, matter, like any heavy object in the universe, will bend light in the same way that a fun house mirror distorts light. So we know that there's an effect called gravitational lensing. And if you have some very distant star, and you have some heavy object in front of that star, it will bend and distort the light from that star. So we have a way of determining where matter is in the universe that has nothing to do with being able to see that matter, whether it's visible or whether it's invisible, uh, it will distort the light from the background. So this is called gravitational lensing. And we've been doing this routinely now for 30 or so years. And when you look at this very distant galaxies, their light is bent and distorted. And you can use that to work out how heavy the thing is in the foreground that's doing the distortion. And the answer that you get is always something like five times more than the mass that you can actually see. So there is often a galaxy in the foreground and you say, oh, it must be that galaxy that's being the funhouse mirror and bending the light. But when you work out how heavy the object is, it's always way too much every time. And so that tells you that most of the matter that's in the foreground that's bending the light uh, is invisible. As I said, there's several other ways that you can uh, determine the presence of dark matter, and they all give the same answer that about 80% of the matter in the universe is dark. And David Berksbacon from Bolton is wondering, is this material everywhere around us, or is this stuff far, far away in our universe? He's just curious if we're swimming in it or, or not. <laughs> Um, that's, that's, that's a great question, and there's a lot of discussion of that lately. I mean, I think the general view is that it's everywhere, that like there's dark matter in your, in the, in your room right now, and it goes, it goes right through everything else. So dark, there could be dark matter particles drifting right through your body right now and through the earth and out the other side, um, perfectly safe. Um, uh, and, um, uh, but others have wondered if there is something to do with the solar wind or something that somehow keeps dark matter out of the solar system. Uh, which would mean that all the experiments we have on Earth to detect dark matter are never going to find anything. So I think the general consensus is that it's absolutely everywhere. The whole universe is just evenly suffused uh, with, well, not evenly suffused, but our, our local region, our galaxy is suffused with dark matter and it's, it's, it's around us right now. But there is at least some discussion that maybe it might not be here on Earth, which would make it a little bit harder to find. That is so weird and awesome. I never thought about the potential of dark matter just flowing all around us and, and going through us and everything. Dark matter possibly flying right through your brain at this exact moment. That is so cool. Astronomy is cool, everyone. <laughs> um, we have a question from, ooh, tough one, Mike Duffy. He's wondering, could you discuss that although we can only see a distance of plus or minus 14 light years, the age of the universe, the universe boundary is much farther away than that. How did the universe manage to expand faster than the speed of light? So I think, I think I'm pretty sure that Mike meant 14 billion light years, not 14 light years. That makes more sense. So, <laughs> so the universe is, uh, is 14 billion uh, years old, give or take. Um, and um, uh, we can't, and, and because light only travels at a finite speed of 300,000 kilometers a second, or about seven times around the world every second, that means that there's a limit to how far out we can see. The universe has already been out, has only been around for 14 billion years. So anything that's farther away than that, the light hasn't actually even got to us yet. Uh, so we know that the universe is much bigger than what we can see. Um, 
And one of the reasons for that is that the universe very early on, like a fraction of a second after the universe began, as, as Mike says, the universe expanded at much faster than the speed of light. Um, and so he said, how is that, how is, his question is, how is that possible? Um, so many of us have heard this rule that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And that comes from Albert Einstein's special theory of relativity. But what he really says is that, um, is that information, individual objects cannot travel faster than the speed of light. So a baseball can't travel faster than the speed of light. But the universe expanding isn't an individual object, it's just a stretching of space. And Einstein's theory of this cosmic speed limit had nothing to say about the actual space itself stretching at faster than the speed of light. So that's actually, as strange as it sounds, that's allowed because it's not transmitting information from one place to another at faster than the speed of light. It's just the whole universe itself moving apart at those very high speeds. So it is actually that, allowed, doesn't break any laws of physics, as, as, as incredible as it sounds. Important note through in there. Uh, speaking of Einstein and his theories, Dan Hargis is wondering, what's your opinion on when we'll have solved the unification theory or the one theory that bridges Newton and Einstein? Uh, so, um, <laughs> so Einstein has this marvelous theory, this general theory of relativity. And it seems as far as, even though the theory is more than hundred years old now, it seems to perfectly explain um, gravity. And every single test that we throw at general relativity, it has passed so far with flying colors. Um, but we know it's not a complete theory of everything because there's another wonderful theory that's 100 years old called quantum mechanics. And that's a theory that explains how things like electronics work. And general relativity doesn't explain electronics. In fact, it's in inconsistent with it. So we've got these two great successes of 20th century physics, general relativity and quantum mechanics, and they're not compatible. Um, so uh, there has to be some, we'd like to think that there is some broader theory that explains both of them, some sort of unification theory. Uh, you know, people have been trying for decades and decades and haven't made a lot of progress. So I'm a bit pessimistic. I think that that's gonna be something that's really hard um, and it might be decades and hundreds of years away. But then again, in the 1890s, a very famous astronomer once said, we are pretty much now know everything there is to know about the universe. And it turned out that he was, you know, within years, he was shown to be completely utterly wrong. So I'd be happy to be wrong, but I think that that's a really hard problem just because we've made so little progress. And I think it's, it's a long way off. Awesome. But there's plenty of other things to do in the meantime. And yeah, I just want to reiterate how important what you just said was about you're happy to be wrong. And I think that when we're looking at science right now in this uh, current lens of what's going on in the world and distrust toward science, that's such an important part of the scientific process is understanding that science is this ongoing pursuit and that things happen and discoveries are made that are surprising. And along the way, there are a lot of hypotheses that are debunked and experiments don't go uh, the way that they're always planned. And so I think that's really important to keep in mind when you're exploring science on a day-to-day -day basis. It's always changing. There are failures along the way and that's part of the scientific process. Um, uh, I just wanna say, I totally agree. Like most scientists don't mind being proved wrong or in fact, they're excited to be proved wrong. And even those that don't like being proved wrong, their favorite thing is proving other scientists wrong. Um, so, you know, <laughs> you know, some people suggest that there's sort of conspiracies or that scientists are covering things up. If there is half of the scientists are covering things up, the other half would love to uncover them. So, um, you know, just that there are so many scientists out there all with different approaches and different ideas means that eventually, if you're patient, uh, we will get to the right answer and mistakes will be uncovered and corrected. Excellent. Uh, Marissa Derry is wondering, when looking at the sky on NASA's ISS feed, so it's the International Space Station, one sees what looks like thunderstorm slash lightning in the distance. What is that? Thank you. So I, I, I'm, I'm not seeing the exact feed that, that you're looking at, Marissa, but I'm pretty sure that really is thunderstorm and lightning uh, viewed from above. Um, you, uh, lightning is, can be produced very high up in the atmosphere, so it's quite readily uh, visible from the International Space Station. And I know that even though they're very busy, the astronauts there sometimes just spend hours just wanting to look out the window and just watching all this lightning and thunder and hurricanes and all that from above. If you haven't taken a look at the NASA website recently, it's definitely a cool place to explore. Um, the ISS has some incredible 
photos of planet Earth. I know personally, I love looking at uh, what hurricanes look like from the view of the astronauts and the cosmonauts on the ISS. It's just an incredible depiction of these huge phenomena that are happening here on our own planet. And it kind of puts everything into perspective of what's going on here on Earth. Uh, Path Hubble at yahoo.com is wondering, what is the name of a good astronomy magazine for a high school student? Um, so, well, uh, there, there, are, there are two main ones. Uh, one is called Sky and Telescope, and the other is called um, Astronomy. Um, uh, Sky and Telescope is based in, in, in Massachusetts, in Cambridge, Mass, and it's actually owned by the American Astronomical Society, which is the professional so society that I'm a member of, that, uh, of all professional astronomers. So I'm a little bit biased towards Sky and Telescope, but, um, but astronomy uh, is, is also a good magazine. You can get both of them almost anywhere and you know, in, in any supermarket or news agent. So Sky and Telescope and Astronomy um, are the two that I would recommend. There's lots of expert stuff in there, but they also have lots of stuff uh, for people just getting started. And of course, there's also huge amounts of stuff on the internet as well. Definitely. I think I'm a little biased towards Sky and Telescope myself because that was definitely something that I received in my own household. And I actually have a Nova colleague who interned there and it was a fantastic experience. Uh, so that's another thing as high schoolers who are interested in this field, definitely look into internship opportunities as a high school student or start thinking about it early on as you make your way into college if you end up going to college. Um, there are great experiences uh, really close to home as well as farther away or even in other countries. Isabella Sawaka, I hope I'm saying that correctly. She's heard a lot about how the Alpha Star Orion Beetlejuice was getting dimmer very quickly in Myco Supernova. A little after, she read an article saying it might have just been covered by space dust. Is there a conclusion to what happened? Um, so I think the short answer is, is that while it's sort of too early to be, be sure, it probably is something like space dust. Betelgeuse, we know, is a dying star, um, uh, and it is nearing the end of its life, and it's going to go supernova any moment now. But of course, by astronomy standards, when we say any moment, it could be tomorrow, but it could also be in like 5,000 years. Uh, so it's clearly a, a star that's not well, and, uh, you know, like, like a car that's running out of gas and the engine sort of hiccups as it's sort of on its last few dregs, Betelgeuse is going through lots of belches and instability. And we know that these stars very late in their lives do produce a lot of this space dust. This sort of, you can think of it more like soot. Uh, and this soot, if it produces enough of it, could dim the star for a little bit. So clearly, as I said, Betelgeuse is not well. And it's something to do with the late stages of its life. But it's probably not quite ready to go supernova just yet. Uh, but when it does, it will be really spectacular. It will be incredibly bright. It might be so bright. It'll be certainly, you'll be able to just look up and see it with your naked eye. It might be so bright that you'll be able to see it during the daytime. And speaking of seeing phenomena in space, whether we're able to with the naked eye or kind of a, a telescope that's accessible for an everyday person versus something very sophisticated, uh, David Burks Bacon is wondering what is expected for the next generation of telescopes coming up in the next five to 10 years. Is there anything we might expect to learn from them that we don't know right now? Oh my goodness, there is so much that we're going to learn when we turn on the next generation of telescopes. Um, I could spend hours talking about all the things that we are poised to finally learn. But, um, but, but let me just pick one. And that's that uh, we're not really sure how planets form. Uh, we know that when a solar system first forms, it's surrounded by a giant sort of frisbee, a spinning sort of frisbee of gas and dust. And we know that the, that gas eventually starts to stick together and make little grains. And those grains then make pebbles. And we sort of wave our hands around and say the pebbles become boulders and the boulders become rocks. And you just keep going and eventually you get planets. But if you actually calculate that, it doesn't really work that well. So we don't really know how planets form. And in particular, we don't know how planets like the Earth form. So some of the telescopes that will be turning on in the next five to 10 years 
have the uh, sharpness of vision to see solar systems forming around other stars. We can never learn how uh, the details of how a solar system formed. We don't have a time machine and we can't go back and see how the Earth formed. But we're hoping to be able to see planets of the same mass and properties of the Earth actually form in real time. And the really exciting thing is, is that, you know, the process takes millions of years, but an Earth-like planet goes around its star once a year. If it doesn't, then it's not very much like Earth. And so that's not that long a time. Uh, the sorts of telescopes that we hope to turn on in the next few years, we hope to be able to see Earth-like planets forming and to see them orbiting their stars once a year and to be accumulating dust and gas and rocks as they orbit. So there's lots of things we're going to learn in the next few years, but I think one of the big ones is how do planets form? And once we know the answer to that, we can work out you know, just how many planets are out there and how many might be like Earth and what are the chances of there being life out there too. Awesome. Uh, before we get to our next question, I just want to thank all of you watching today. Thank you so much for all of the amazing questions that we're getting from, from you. Um, I'd like to take a moment right now to introduce another one of my colleagues who's behind the scenes currently. Her name is Jamie. Welcome, Jamie. Hi, Suki. Thank you for having me. Hi, Jamie. How are you today? I'm great. And I'm here with a special message to our viewers at home. So first, I want to say thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon while GBH gives you some space. And by that, I mean more information about astronomy. This has been fascinating. You know, viewers and listeners turn to GBH for many reasons, whether it's to learn something new about the stars or dark matter or to simply be entertained for a while. So if you feel GBH is worth watching, worth listening to, and worth supporting, then we ask you to please make a donation if you can. Today, when you show your support by making a one-time donation of $60 or by giving $5 a month over the course of the year, we'll say thanks by sending you this GBH covered tumbler. It's a beautiful navy color, just like the midnight sky. So visit gbh.org, that's wgbh.org slash support events to make a donation in any amount. Every dollar our donors give enables GBH to continue producing great science programming like this virtual event and like NOVA all year round. So simply click on that link in the chat tab now and contribute what you can. Thanks again for joining us and uh, back to Suki and Brian for a more very interesting discussion about astronomy. I'm learning a lot today. Thank you so much, Jamie. And just to reiterate what Jamie said, you've probably seen this message before about viewers like you and how much we appreciate you and really depend and appreciate your support. So please check out that donation tab if you're able and willing to donate today. We'd really appreciate it. Now, back to questions with Brian. Uh, it looks like we have a new one from John Gadis, who's wondering, would you take a couple of minutes to explain dark energy and how we know it does or doesn't exist? Right. So, um, you know, if, if dark matter wasn't embarrassing enough, uh, dark energy is an even more mysterious phenomenon and another instant Nobel Prize to whoever can figure out dark energy. So dark energy seems to be some sort of uh, anti-gravity force that is actually pushing the universe apart. Um, we know that the universe is expanding and in the good old days when everything sort of made sense, uh, we thought the universe's expansion was slowing. In fact, it was expanding, but it was, getting, it was getting bigger, slower and slower. But what we discovered, and this was work done uh, again in, in Massachusetts, uh, 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 well, it was done by teens around the world, but there was uh, several people from Harvard involved. Um, uh, what, we, what we now know is that the universe is not only expanding, but that expansion is actually accelerating. So the universe is getting bigger and it's doing so faster and faster. And uh, that's a bit of a surprise. Uh, and the explanation we have is that there is some sort of anti-gravity force, not really a force, but just some sort of a property of space itself maybe that is pushing everything apart and making the universe expand faster and faster. We have no idea what this is, uh, but we just call it dark energy. And so the question from John is how do we know if it does or doesn't exist? 
And unlike dark matter, we, we sort of don't see its effects directly. I talked about gravitational lensing earlier. It's more just that uh, we know the universe is accelerating and universes shouldn't do that. And so the presumption is, is that the reason why the universe is accelerating is because there is something there that is pushing it apart. Uh, Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity describes how the universe should behave. And it says that if you have a universe uh, with stuff in it, then the gravity of all that stuff should slowly slow down the expansion of the universe. And the fact that that's not happening suggests that there must be something else in the universe that's pushing it apart. So it's not a really super satisfactory answer, but we just have no other explanation at the moment uh, than just saying that there must be just some sort of substance in the universe which is causing it to accelerate. Now, speaking of our expanding universe, Gordy is wondering, do CMB measurements suggest that we are reasonably near the center or the origin point of the expanding universe? Right, so CMB stands for Cosmic Microwave Background, and that's this faint glow that you can see in all directions, which is all that's left of the incredible heat uh, that, and light that was produced early on in the universe's history. So we actually see um, a remnant of the Big Bang, this Cosmic Microwave Background, this glow in all directions. Um, now, what, what, because the glow seems to be even in all directions and because the universe looks the same in every direction, there are galaxies and stars and there's no real difference every direction you look at, you might come to the conclusion that we live in the center of the universe. And if you measure how fast the universe is expanding away from us, it seems to be expanding the same speed in every direction. So it looks like we are at this exact center of the universe and the universe is expanding away from us. But that's uh, a bit of an illusion, it's misleading. Uh, it turns out that no matter where you are in the universe, uh, things would look like that. The usual um, analogy that astronomers like to use is think of um, uh, a, a cake that has raisins in it. And when you bake the cake in the oven and the cake swells, all the raisins move apart. Now, if you're standing on any one of those raisins buried inside the cake, from your perspective, it looks like every raisin is moving away from you. And you come to the conclusion that you are at the center of the cake. But even uh, a raisin that was significantly offset from the center of the cake would see this effect. So we're pretty sure that there is no specific center to the universe. Um, uh, an another analogy might be a thinking of the surface of the earth. If I show you a map of the world and say, where's the center? Um, there's no center. Um, you know, London is not the center and Toronto is not the center and Boston is not the center. There's no particular place on the surface of the earth that's the center. Um, and it's the same with the universe. Every place is sort of equal. Um, we are absolutely sure that we are not in a special, particularly special place in the universe and that there isn't any meaning of, of the origin or the center of the universe, which is, which is pretty humbling to realize that we're, we're not in a special place at all. But that, that key realization explains a lot of what we see. You had me until you put raisins in cake. <laughs> <laughs> Can they be chocolate chips? <laughs> but... Whatever works for you. <laughs> So speaking of expansion, Doris in Randolph, Mass is wondering, what's the current view regarding the end of the universe relating to expansion? In other words, will it continue expanding forever or eventually collapse onto itself? Um, so let me give a plug for my, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Katie Mack has just written a book called The End of Everything. It is the one of the best books I have read. It's completely accessible, it has no equations. It's explained in very simple language. And she talks about the five different ways in which the universe could end. Um, none of them are pretty. It's not, there's no happy endings here, but fortunately they're all a long, long way off. So Katie Mack talks about five different possibilities, but the one that's most likely is one called the heat death of the universe. And what it means is that the universe will just keep expanding and expanding and uh, eventually all the stars will run out of fuel and go out and the universe will just become dark and it will just slowly get colder and colder and colder in complete darkness as the universe just rushes off um, forever. So that's not a very exciting end, but the heat, what's called the heat death uh, seems to be uh, the most likely way that things will wrap up. Uh, Professor Mack in this book, The End of Everything, talks about some other more dramatic ways in which the universe just spontaneously disrupts or collapses in on itself and or space time itself rips apart. Those are somewhat more exciting. Uh, and I, I really commend this book if you want to get a full understanding of the different ways uh, the universe can end. And I see that Liz has posted a link to it. I've read it. It's just fantastic. Uh, check it out. It sounds awesome.
Um, Time to segue back to telescopes. Stephen Pugh from Alston is wondering, what's that technique where many telescopes are combined to make one big telescope? Can you explain how observations along different frequencies of the EM spectrum answer different questions? Uh, so those are two great questions, um, Stephen. So let me answer the first one, which is the technique where many telescopes are combined to make one big telescope. So this, tele this technique is called interferometry. Um, and the idea is, is that um, the bigger the telescope, the bigger the, the, the width of the telescope, the sharper the vision you get. So if you want to see something really, really small and detailed, you build a really big telescope. Um, but at some point, it starts to become impractical to build a big telescope. You know, uh, you can build a telescope that's a meter across or that's 10 meters across. And the telescopes that we're building now are 30 meters across. But, you know, what you really like to do is build a telescope that's, you know, a thousand kilometers across. Uh, that's just not practical, you know, from an engineering perspective. You just can't build things that big. But it turns out that you don't have to. What you can do is you can take two telescopes that are a long way apart and you can link the signals electronically uh, and then simulate uh, one big telescope. So it doesn't, it's not quite the same as building one telescope. Uh, it, it can't do everything that one giant telescope can do. Um, but it can answer a lot of questions. And so that's a technique that I and others use routinely. And there is, uh, if you remember from, I mean, I don't even know what, what month or year it is anymore. So I think it was earlier this year, or maybe it was last year, there was a group called the Event Horizon Telescope and they link telescopes across the entire planet. So this is now, we're talking at a telescope that's 12,000 kilometers across. And that gave them such sharp vision, they were able to make a picture of what a black hole looked like. So it's amazing what you can do. In principle, you can put a telescope on Mars and connect it electronically to a telescope on Earth and have a telescope that was millions of kilometers across. We're not quite there yet, but yeah, in principle, there's no limit to how big you can make a telescope if you link two smaller ones. The other question Stephen had is, can you explain how observations along different frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum answer different questions? So there's lots of different types of light. Uh, there's red light and there's blue light and there's green light, of course. But there's other types of light too. And they're, they're ones that you've heard of, even though you might not think of them as light. Uh, radio waves that you use uh, when, when every time you talk on, on, a, on a mobile phone, uh, those are a type of light. Microwaves that you use to heat up your food in the oven. Uh, X-rays that you use to look at a broken bone. Those are all different types of light. Um, and it turns out that different objects in the universe are good at producing different types of light. Uh, there's lots of details behind this, but a simple version of it is, is it all comes down to temperature. So hot objects produce uh, some types of light and cold objects produce a different type of light. So if you want to study a star, it turns out that stars typical temperature might be um, uh, 10,000 degrees and an object that's 10,000 degrees gives off visible light. Um, if you want to study uh, the hot gas between galaxies, that gas is a more like at a temperature of say a million degrees or 10 million degrees and objects at that temperature give off x-rays. So if you try and use visible light to study the gas between stars, you can't see it because uh, it's giving off x-rays. And if you want to look at the cold uh, clouds of molecules that form stars, those clouds are quite cold and they glow in the light of radio waves. So again, you can't see those with a normal telescope. They're not giving off visible light. Uh, they, they give off radio waves and you have to use a radio telescope to see them. So the answer, Stephen, is, is that uh, they find different tel types of telescopes in different parts of the spectrum are sensitive to objects of different temperature. And so if you want to see all the different types of objects from the very cold ones to the, the middling ones, to the very hot ones, you have to use all these different types of telescopes to put the whole picture together. I like to think of it as, as like an orchestra. Um, you know, if you just, you know, pick your favorite symphony and if you just listen to the bassoons, uh, you know, it doesn't sound that great. If you just listen to the flutes or the triangles, um, it also doesn't sound that great. But when you put everything together, it sounds awesome. And, you know, the universe is essentially a combination of all these different instruments and you need to listen to all of them combined to get the whole cosmic symphony. Use different instruments to hear different instruments. It's very cool. Um, now, some, some phenomena we can see with our naked eye, and so I'm reading this question from Corinna Smith in Waltham, and she's reminding us that the Leonids are coming this week, which feels crazy because I feel like I was just 
watching and writing about the Perseid meteor shower just yesterday. So can you tell us where its parent comet actually is in our solar system right now and when it might have left the dust that we'll be seeing next week? Okay, so yeah, so uh, meteor showers are pretty cool. Um, they're not as cool as you think they are. People sort of imagine a meteor shower as more like watching fireworks, as things like flying everywhere. A meteor shower is more like one meteor a minute, um, which is a lot, um, but uh, uh, it's not, so you have to be patient. You have to just sort of sit there and lie on your back and look at the sky and wait, but it's pretty cool when you start seeing one every minute. And these there are meteors every night of the year, but there's particular times of the year when, uh, when you have lots of, lots of meteors more than normal. And the reason why is because there are comets in our solar system, and these comets uh, are all um, uh, orbiting, uh, orbiting the sun, and they leave behind a trail of dust and dirt uh, as they orbit. And so every time the Earth's orbit passes through that trail, um, uh, we see lots of meteors. So you might think of it as like driving along the freeway, and if there's one particular patch of the freeway that has lots of mosquitoes or bugs, then when you every time you drive over that part of the freeway, you get lots of bugs splattering on your windshield, and then you, you don't see anything again until you pass that part of the freeway again. So these meteor showers are just going through a part of the solar system where essentially lots of bugs splatter on the Earth's windshield. And so uh, you, know, you, you mentioned the Leonids, which are coming up. So they are a particular um, meteor shower that's associated with a comet called Temple Tunnel. Um, it's a comet that orbits uh, the Earth every 33 years. And right now it's, it's not anywhere near um, the Earth. It's way past, out past the orbit of Jupiter in the, in the outer solar system. But just by orbiting over and over again every 33 years for thousands and thousands of years, um, it, has, it has built up the trail. So you ask the question, when did it leave the dust that we'll be seeing next week? Uh, at no particular time, it's just all the dust that has built up over thousands or tens of thousands of years from this comet going uh, around the same orbit over and over again. Brian, do you know when that comet will be at a closer approach to us, when it will come back around to Earth? Uh, yeah, so um, you know we're about two thirds of the way through its orbit at the moment. So the next time it gets close to the sun is in 2031. So that's that's still a ways off. But um, we should be able, you should be able to see the comet, you know, with you know with binoculars or something in 2031. Um, that's a long time to wait. But there are quite a few comets out there. There's a few comets every year that are visible, um, and, and uh, some of them are regular comets that repeat, um, you know, every 20 or 30 years, and others are ones are one-offs. So uh, go to one of the apps that I talked about earlier, or go to your astronomy magazine, and you can find. Uh, whatever comets uh, are in the sky at the moment. Now, I'm blanking on its name, but there was one just uh, a few months ago that was really quite spectacular early in the Neowise, morning. right? Yeah, yeah. Neowise, that's right, yeah. comet Neowise. So, you know, you sort of think of comets as sort of a once in a century thing, but there are comets, there are a few comets every year. You just need to know exactly where to look. And by their nature, they're always quite close to the sun, which means that you either see them right um, after sunset or just before sunrise. So often that means sort of getting up early in the morning to see them. And also finding somewhere where there are no buildings or trees in the way, which you know can be tricky, but definitely worth the effort. Brian, Jim Rao is wondering, do you have any advice for a high school senior looking forward to majoring in astrophysics or astronomy in college? Sure. Um, so uh, I think the key thing is to be on top of the basics. So astronomy draws on lots of different topics across science. And the main ones are physics, math, and computers. So I would say that uh, even if you're not that excited by the physics and the math, you, you need to know it to be able to understand the astronomy. You know, stars move in orbits, and that's all just physics. Uh, but the other thing that's more and more important is computers. Um, so much of astronomy these days is processing data and writing software and developing computational tools. So astronomers spend a lot of time writing code. So being good with computers is pretty important. Uh, the, what language we use is sort of changes every 20 years or so, but uh, right now the language that most astronomers use is Python. Uh, so learning a little bit about Python, it's actually not that hard a language and there's lots of great tutorials on the web I, I just taught myself. So learning a bit of Python and just keeping up with your physics and your math, I think is the best way to prepare yourself for the astronomy that's gonna come down the track. It sounds great and I think it's, 
it's important to find avenues that make you really excited about the fields that you might not be naturally that enthused about. Like I, I know from personal experience, I hated physics in college. And it wasn't until I got my job at Nova and I got to hang out with Brian Keston, who's a physicist at Harvard, and he makes it really accessible and fun that I was like, this is the coolest field ever. So I think finding avenues like that, um, Brian has, this is not Brian Gainsler, but Brian Keston has a YouTube channel called What the Physics that's hosted by Nova. And it just makes these subjects really approachable and kind of more delightful than maybe your physics 101 class is going to make them. But getting through those 101 classes enables you to go forward into some really fascinating material. So just stick it out and it'll definitely be worth it. Yeah, you got to learn to walk, walk before you can fly. And it's a bit frustrating. You just want to get to all the good stuff. I want to study nebulae and the Big Bang. And, you know, I, I have to say a lot of the fit and physics I did at high school and college just wasn't that exciting. But, you know, I, I had my eye on the prize and I knew that I had to get through all that stuff in order to be able to get to the good stuff. And you know what? Like, you know, in terms of maths, like the most complicated math that I normally use now is just trigonometry. Like I have to do causes and signs and tangents, like high school stuff. But, you know, some, some astronomers use very advanced mathematics. But most of the maths I do is just it's just stuff that I can, you know, I can just do on my, uh, it's not really showing up on my camera, but just on a hand calculator. So, um, but, you know, you just need to have all that stuff under the hood for when you need it. Awesome. I think we have time just for one more question. So I'm going to get to this one from Isabella Sawicka, who said, in science class, we watched a documentary called The Edge of the Universe, which talked about the idea of a domain wall where if you passed it, you would not be able to survive because of different circumstances, such as multiple dimensions or the laws of physics being different. Is this a possibility that we might ever discover or will it remain just something to wonder about? Yeah, wow. Um, so Isabella, um, if you ask me right now, I would say it's something just to wonder about, but um, uh, that there is, Arthur C. Clarke had these famous two laws. His first law was is that when a famous scientist says something is possible, he's almost, he, he or she is almost always right. And the second law is that when a famous scientist says that something is impossible, he or she is almost always wrong. Um, so I think that it's just an idea that we'll never know nothing about, but, um, but you know, I might be proved wrong. But there is this idea that there are these different zones where the laws of physics are completely different mm -hmm. and they're somehow uh, kept separate from each other uh, with sort of shields between them so they don't interfere. But if you did somehow cross into a different one, then the laws of physics would be different. Maybe the atoms in your body would dissolve or you couldn't breathe or something like that. Um, I, I, it is a really interesting idea, but it's just a very hard idea to test. So uh, unless there's some big surprise or breakthrough, I think it's something to think about. And it's a great sort of philosophical discussion, but there's not a lot of measurements that we can make right now. But if there's nothing that rules it out. I mean, in principle, that, that might be how the universe is. Thank you, Brian. I'm going to spin it back to Jamie, uh, my colleague over at GBH, one more time. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Suki. It's me again. Hi. Um, and hello again, viewers at home who are joining us. You know, I just want to remind everybody contributions from viewers like you support GBH and NOVA's ongoing efforts to develop new and better ways to reach and engage audiences, students, and educators. And that really promotes a deeper understanding of science and the critical role it plays in our lives. So you, yes, you at home can help bring more stories of science to life. All you need to do is visit wgbh.org slash support events to make a $60 donation all at once or in monthly installments. That's just $5 a month. And you will receive again, this GBH Midnight Blue Tumblr as our thank you gift. Just click on the link in the chat tab and that will bring you over to our site where it is so easy to make a donation. So thanks again for joining us, for listening to the support messages. And moreover, thank you for your support if you are already a member or intend to give. So with that, I leave it back to you, Suki and Brian. Thank you, Jamie. Again, we really appreciate your support and for you joining us all today. We couldn't make this show, for example, without all of your fascinating questions. And we've really appreciated taking the time to allow Brian to answer them, which I think he's done an amazing job doing. Um, 
we are wrapping up, unfortunately. Again, thank you for joining us. If you are really curious about Brian's research and what it's like to be a working astronomer, I highly recommend that you check out his Twitter. He's got a great handle, SciBry, which I love. It's at S-C-I-B-R-Y. And Brian, you have a website as well, correct? Uh, yeah, you can just go to briangainsler.net. Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining us. I know that Bailey also dropped Ryan's website in the chat, so definitely check it out there. You can just click on the link and it'll take you right to Brian's site. And we really appreciate all of your support of GBH and for joining us today to learn more about astronomy and the world around us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.